Hello, my another guest today is Professor Jan Walensky from the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Professor Walensky is an educator and one of the most prominent people in the open access, open science and open education movements. His crucial ideas and work definitely changed the landscape of the contemporary education. He's also the founder of Public Knowledge Project, a nonprofit initiative aimed at developing tools used to make the results of publicly founded research freely available. And recently, Professor Walensky has been awarded with the Spark Innovator Award. Professor Walensky, welcome and thank you for, for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You are, without any doubt, the pioneer of the open access. <laughs> uh, I think that one can say that you've been actually practicing it before it was officially established. Could you please tell us how it all started? Okay, I mean, I think many of us were involved in the early days, um, but in 1998, uh, I worked with a newspaper to share research. It was the early days of the web, and we wanted to see ways in which we could uh, begin to use the web to share knowledge. And in that project, uh, I was in the Faculty of Education and we were sharing knowledge about computers and education. Uh, I found it very frustrating that I wasn't able to share the research with the public. Uh, I am a school teacher uh, by trade and uh, I work in a Faculty of Education that's very interested in the education of the public. And here we were producing research that we could not share with teachers. Uh, or the public, the students that we were researching, the schools we were working in. Uh, so in 1998 I decided that I should probably try to fix this problem. That uh, of all the things that were going on here in my own backyard, in my own area of research, uh, we were facing this frustrating issue. So I started uh, before it was called uh, Open Access. Uh, I used to think that it should be called free to read in those days, but um, a little later they decided open access was the best title. Some people, especially in the scholar publishing environment, uh, used to perceive open access as some sort of threat to their business. But it seems that now this wave of, of criticism is starting to diminish and is uh, significantly less, less visible. The publishing houses realize that uh, they have to adapt to the changing uh, and constantly evolving market that is, that is vastly influenced by the technological improvements. Um, however, I think it's still too early to, to, to uh, <laughs> you know, proclaim the victory uh, of the open access. What are, the, in your opinion, the major obstacles to, to, to open access, to open science in general? Um, uh, I agree. It's, well, it's not too early. I think uh, we have reached a tipping point. I think we have um, the support of the publishers who are uh, looking at new business models, looking at ways of making open access work for them. Uh, and I think we have government funding agencies um, so I would say that uh, maybe not a victory dance yet, um, but I, I think the tide has turned. The obstacles that remain, uh, we still need to figure out a, um, a business model that uh, will allow all of the different disciplines to participate in open access. We need to find a way of rationalizing uh, the vast differences in costs in the biomedical field, uh, where it's common to pay $3,000 for an open access article, uh, and in the humanities, where it's more common to pay nothing. Uh, so we need to um, face that challenge of an economically rational model. We need to work out um, that economic model on a global scale so that no one is excluded from the research, um, ability to participate in the research. Uh, and we do need to overcome some of the, no, I wouldn't say resistance, but the indifference of uh, faculty members and my colleagues who um, are not that interested in anything uh, related to the question of access. They're interested in being published. Um, so 
I think it's only fair to say that we have some work to do uh, within the professorate, some work to do with publishers in arriving at an economically rational and a, a fair price, uh, and some work to do with the public in terms of educating them about this new access and the responsibilities that are associated with it and the opportunities. Um, so in public libraries and in schools, we need to start thinking about what it means to learn about, to, for the public to learn about access to research. Um, and uh, so I, um, it, it's not a victory yet, but I, I think it's, uh, the tide has turned and we need to work out the details. Uh, it seems that for you, open access isn't just a matter of making better use of available technical tools. It's something more like uh, an issue of social justice. <laughs> Uh, am I right? Is, is it not only about scientists? It, it, should open access be seen in a broader scope of, of open education? Yeah, so I would take it further. I think it's a human right. Um, and the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights does talk about access to science, but I would say uh, the human right is uh, a right to know what is known, uh, a right to be part of the discussion and critique of knowledge. Um, and that doesn't mean that everything needs to be available for free. It, it means that we should be supporting and using uh, government money and research money to help enable the, the, the maximum level of access that's possible. Um, and I think as part of that human right, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to think about the educational responsibilities. Uh, and the social justice part follows from that human right um, because we have a long history of inequitable access um, in developing countries, uh, in, in parts of Europe, uh, there isn't equal access to research at this point. So I think it is, um, we need to start with a principle, and, and I would take this human right as a principle, and we need to work out from there in terms of all of the details. So it isn't just science for scientists, that's for sure. Uh, I think probably some of the most interesting elements will be uh, professional uptake by physicians and uh, teachers and lawyers, um, the, its role in the school and education. Uh, to a certain degree, researchers have, al have always had access, at least in, in uh, the developed world. Um, so it, it is always, or at least what's most interesting and fascinating is the questions of equity and wider and public access. Thank you. Uh, I would like to talk about public knowledge project. Uh, you provide a set of free open source uh, software tools that are aimed at supporting researchers in open publishing and editing and content management. Uh, these are open journal systems, open monograph press, open conference systems and open harvester systems. Got them all. Uh, could you give us some more details about these tools? Okay. Uh, I, I think of them as more than tools. Um, they're publishing platforms. So they attempt to take the whole publishing process and make the um, resources available. It's like distributing printing presses would have been in the 19th century or the early 20th century. Um, enabling people, uh, scientists, researchers, uh, scholars, to uh, set up their own journal online uh, to see through, and again, it's not just the publishing, it's the whole workflow. The submission, the peer review, the editing, the layout and design, and finally the publishing and the indexing. So we um, took the idea that uh, we could bring together the open source software movement and the open access publishing movement uh, and provide um, resources that were platforms, publishing platforms, um, we've tried to address the monograph question because uh, everything has been focused on the journal up to now, and we have been. Um, so two years ago, we uh, released the monograph system. Uh, and again, it's um, to say that uh, most of the work has always been done by scholars. The publishers have been helpful, but the peer review and the editing has always been a matter of scholarly uh, participation and labor. Uh, and so why not um, give people the resources they need to, to undertake this? And uh, the open journal systems, as you mentioned, um, is uh, probably the premier piece. We have 6,000 journals around the world that uh, are actively using uh, OJS to publish. 
and half of those are in developing countries, but we also have uh, some of the leading universities in the United States and uh, Canada uh, using it as well. Um, it's available in 25 languages or 30, not always up to date in every language. Uh, Polish is, may not be up to date right now, <laughs> but uh, we've had certainly translations. Um, and so in, in that way, it is uh, both a free resource or tool, if you like, um, but it's also a, a statement about how this work can be done. It's a statement uh, about the cooperation that has always made scholarly publishing different um, than other forms of publishing. The authors aren't paid, the editors and peer reviewers aren't paid. It's a cooperative effort to share knowledge. And the tool, uh, when we were, we used to use printing presses, mm, I don't think we were going to develop a printing press and mail it out, put it in a wood crate and send it to Warsaw. Um, but now with this new, the internet and the ability to, to share resources and this open source software movement, uh, which in some ways uh, preceded open access and in some ways was a stranger kind of creation because it, uh, open source software was developed by professional programmers, not by researchers, um, and was always a, a mix of uh, corporate interests and uh, business interests, so uh, as well as uh, volunteer work and, and labor. Um, so the, so our, the Public Knowledge Project's uh, goal then has been to um, be part of an argument, a part of a uh, description or demonstration project around what scholarship is about, uh, and at the same time to develop, as it has, in, in a way that surprises me, uh, very successful. We think, um, if you'll forgive a little boasting, but we are uh, we're the largest, most widely used platform for managing and publishing uh, journals. And certainly, uh, are very pr we're very proud of uh, what we've contributed in the developing world. Um, in Latin America is one of our strongest users, and uh, uh, the work in Spanish and Portuguese has been um, yeah, exemplary in terms of uh, the contributions of language and translations. So it's been a community effort. Um, we have uh, many software contributors from around the world. And um, it has taken on a kind, not a life of its own, but it, uh, it started as a very modest project and uh, it's uh, grown into something much larger. And so I am very proud of the team behind it. We have about a dozen uh, people involved um, working in the programming and doing community relations, a very good management system, uh, manager and, and a system of, of uh, support from Simon Fraser University. So it, um, yeah, it's a, a, it's a project in a modest sense, and uh, it's part of an open access movement that needed some resources in terms of software. Uh, you have just partly you know, answered my next question, but nonetheless, I will, I will ask it. Uh, you supposedly monitor the number of, of uh, users installing this software. Uh, how popular is it? And uh, as you just, just said, could you say something more about the users? Uh, they are not only from the United States, they are also from South America, yeah? Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, as I said, we, we, um, and we, I mean, it's hard to know. One of the open source software principles is you don't, people can use it freely. They don't have to register. We don't have to, they don't have to let us know they're even using it. So um, Latin America is our largest user. The 6,000 uh, active journals, um, we might have a third of them uh, in Latin America, um, but we're very proud of the 400 or so journals in Africa, um, the 500 or uh, uh, not, actually well more than 500 journals in, in uh, Indonesia. Um, so there are um, a, a great deal of take up and the translations that have been done of the system into Vietnamese, um, into Russian, into uh, Polish, have all been part of a community effort. So it has, uh, in, itself, uh, in, in, in a way, grown organically. We have, um, the users are interesting in the sense that uh, many times it, it can be an issue of academic freedom. Uh, these can be very highly specialized journals. Uh, we have a Sijek, a single philosopher. Um, uh, Sijek, who uh, has a journal named after him and Sijek studies. Um, and so we see it as, um, a way not just of making it free, but of allowing new fields to develop. Uh, we see it as building uh, small communities 
against the mega journal and against the very popular and, and powerful journals like Nature and Science. Here's a way to build a, a, a journal around a small community of scholars. We see it as a way of developing research culture and skills in communities. So there's a lot of pressure in developing countries to publish in the big journals, to publish in the north. And we think that that undermines the uh, building of local research cultures. So to, have a, uh, to start a journal among graduate students or to st start a journal among a group of faculty members is to start building a research culture in itself. The peer review process, the management of manuscripts. So the journal um, software and, and the monograph publishing software and the conference software have always um, been about more than open access, but have always had open access at the forefront. We have users who don't use it for open access, who charge uh, subscriptions and who um, put a toll. Uh, and again, in the open source spirit, we have to accept and be happy with that. Um, but it is, uh, we see it as a way of, of um, and again, uh, as an educator, um, you have to teach in very different ways. Um, and so sometimes telling people something is not always the best way of, of convincing them. If you say that, I think this is so important, I've built something for you. If you say that uh, uh, my research grants have paid the price of it and we offer it to you, um, then that's another way of, of teaching people about new possibilities. Um, open access advocates often a lot of stress on the beneficial effect uh, opening science has on the society, the economy, uh, but it sometimes seems that those people who are mostly reserved to, to open uh, access are the scientists themselves. <laughs> and it, it seems that they are simply afraid that, that open access, that opening uh, uh, research and the results of their, of their research could be in some way destructive to their careers. Uh, I think especially as far as metrics are concerned. Uh, how would you answer to this type of concern? Uh, I, um, I, I don't think it's a, um, even a resistance. I think there's an indifference and a focus and an, uh, I mean I hate to say ignorance in the case of my own colleagues, um, but there is uh, uh, they have their heads down at the bench and at the, the word processor and they're producing work. Uh, they have a reward structure that says just get it published and you're done in the best journal you can. Um, and that's all they've learned and that's all that they've needed. Uh, and we're coming around and saying oh no, 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 you've got to put it in an archive and you've got to find an open access journal and it might have an article. Processing fee and so we have complicated this and um, and it's okay for me because I actually am, make my academic career in promoting open access and publishing on it. Um, so it's not fair for me to say that you should be as interested as I am. Uh, and so I'm uh, tolerant and patient. Um, I have been frustrated at times, of course. Um, but I think it's, uh, there isn't anything in principle that other scholars object to. I've never heard I mean, we have had concerns about um, uh, the, the peer reviews and the, uh, sorry, the, the citations and the impact. And the studies uh, are controversial. You'll interview Stephen Harnard and he might want to speak to the, this, but um, it does look like the, that it has an impact on readership for sure, increases the readership, so no scientist objects to that. Uh, and it does look like it, um, we need more studies that it increases the citations and every scientist wants that. Um, and the fact that Nature has a mega journal, the Royal Society of London has a mega journal, open access mega journals in both cases, um, suggests that the prestige factor is nothing now. Um, it is no longer, uh, and again I respect the chasing of prestige and reputation. But open access has crossed those barriers. The top ranked journal in biology is PLOS Biology and open access, never been printed journal. Um, so we have in a sense um, tested the patience, I guess, of our colleagues in terms of taking time to get all these pieces in place. But I think we have enough examples uh, and they can take their time. I'm a very patient man. Uh, and there's no point in rushing people. Um, 
but there is no reason for concern. And so each time an objection comes up, we're happy to address it. But I think the larger question has always been in terms of open science is that you just have to make it part of the ecology, part of the environment. Uh, and that's our job, and we can't expect other people to do it for us. Open science supports not only open access, but also open data. There's been a lot of talk about uh, open notebook research, or open process, or open reviews. And I think that in certain disciplines, like biology, uh, it seems that this new technology combined with the open approach can dramatically change the, the, the practices that have been uh, well established in the, in the scientific world. Um, namely, the article model might be replaced with something like nebulae of data figures, etc. And uh, while the core of the article, the story itself, uh, will be left behind and could it result in some sort of disappearance of, of, of the work or the author? Ah, this is uh, Michel Foucault yeah. and the death of <laughs> the author. Like <laughs> and this is, uh, no. Uh, in physics today, it's not unusual in high energy physics using a particle accelerator to have a hundred authors uh, on an article, on a five page, three to five page article. Is the author still a prominent romantic figure in a case like that? No. Um, Science is a very collaborative enterprise. You do need a credit system. You do need checks and balances on people's careers. Uh, and I think um, the data movement will respond to that. It is an easy and simple thing to start tracking people's contributions to data. Uh, and I think it will. I, I agree the article may be jeopardized in the sense that the accumulation of data will be the critical factor. The articles will be interesting. Um, but the larger overall breakthroughs will result from the accumulative effect of, of the data. Uh, credit can be given for that, so let's not worry about the careers of these individuals. Um, and I would say also that um, in terms of uh, dramatic scientific breakthroughs, uh, open data is far more important than open access because uh, the possibilities of open data around reanalysis, around replication studies, uh, and around the aggregated and cumulative effect of having uh, live data streams from projects, ongoing projects, in the social sciences as much as anywhere, all of those um, have not been within our reach before. And so it's one thing to say that an article is free, but it's always been available in a research library. It's another to say we've never had this data shared before. We've never been able to um, create an aggregate set of data. Uh, we've never been able to check data on the fly and to build studies and results um, that are real-time results of data collection. Uh, and the, even the verification uh, elements around it. So uh, I would say that in terms of scientific payoff, um, and, and, and I mean scientific payoff in, in the social sciences, probably in the humanities too, but largely in the social sciences and in the natural sciences, um, it, it will be uh, much more uh, dramatic than uh, open access has been. Professor Walensky, my last question. Uh, would you personally recommend young scientists uh, who are only starting their uh, careers to, to publish in open access? Yes, uh, and I have many times. Uh, and it's, um, I know it's difficult to, uh, for someone uh, of my age to uh, give advice like that because it's easy for me to say. And, and when I started, no, I did not publish, or there was no open access in the 80s, uh, when I first started my career. Um, but I think the, the uh, in some ways, I, I don't have to give that advice. I think it's, uh, the writing is on the wall. Um, if, they can, if a young scientist can see that the work is being distributed, uh, the work is being tweeted, the work is being cited, if they can see that the journals are much more responsive, the open access journals turn out to be much quicker in the turnaround time. If they can see that Nature and the Royal Society uh, are publishing open access, um, then uh, it doesn't take much convincing. Um, I think it's much more exciting for them. We used to have to wait years for citations. They can get a Twitter peak uh, immediately on publication. Um, we would uh, have uh, um, always a, a long process of trying to discover how our work was used, 
Um, they will see immediately the downloads, uh, the geographical distribution. Um, they will begin to hear from people. So it, it um, in some ways, much more exciting, uh, possibly more competitive, I suppose, on a global scale. Um, but I think in the key sense of, of research, the notion of collaboration and connection, um, the, the reduction in isolation, the ability of uh, young scholars to compete, if you like, or to be prominent and found. Um, so there was a time when uh, if you couldn't get into nature or science, you were invisible. Um, not anymore. If you can get into the Twittersphere, if you like, and the blogosphere, then it's a, so it, it, it has equalized the playing fields, a uh, playing field in terms of research, not entirely, and, and uh, I would never say no to, to nature. Um, uh, so it would be, um, I, I don't want to over romanticize, or, 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 but I do think, uh, yes, at the best of times and not the worst of times at, the, at this point. Professor Walensky, thank you very much. It was a nice, it was a pl real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.